Alrighty. We have two 70s D35s here. They're uh, about as similar as I can imagine any two guitars being. This one is serial number 274. And this one is serial number 344. So this one is a little bit younger, but only about a, about a year. They're both 70s. They're both Indian Rosewood. Uh, the back's quite a bit different. Uh, you can see that. This one over here has got the really light pepper sprinkled rosewood uh, that I like a lot. This one's got a darker rosewood. It's still got the pepper sprinkles in it though. I can still see the pepper sprinkles, but it's a darker, a darker wood. Um, that's a little bit unusual. This might have probably been one of the more premium woods, you know. Martin might have picked that one. So what else we got on these things? They both have been highly modified. They both have Granadillo bridges on them, Southeast Asian rosewood bridge plates, Evo frets, bone nut, open back tuners, bone shatter. They both have the same pins. There's one difference. Large sound hole. This one's got a large sound hole. This has got a four and a quarter inch, what I call the half Tony sound hole. And this one has a regular sound hole. So the question we're going to look at today is, should I enlarge the sound hole on this one? <laughs> let's listen to these two guitars. And let's see what we think. Let's start with the regular one first. Prop this up. And again, I am not in my usual shop here. I am in my remote location in Los Alamos. I'm not using my regular recording equipment, but I have used this stuff for years before I got the good stuff. So it's all right. I trust it well enough. So let's check it out. This is the regular sound hole guitar. And then I'm going to point out some differences that I hear, if I hear any differences. Okay? So here we go. <laughs>
guitars are really 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 close still um, I did pick up a few differences and I did this video differently this way by the way normally I play all those parts on one guitar and then I play the other guitar and I play all the parts on those and then I edit and I splice them back and forth and that kind of thing but I'm using a different video software here and it's not as easy to move clips around as it was Anyway, I just thought I'd do something different this time, and that is I actually physically set the guitar down and picked the other guitar up. So I got to hear myself more immediate A-Bs as I went along. Every time I hit one of those, I heard the actual A-B. Uh, that was interesting. Um, I might start doing it that way because it's easier to edit for one thing. I just cut out the stuff I don't want, and then I eliminate the gaps, and I'm good. You know, I don't have to move clips around. Anyway. <laughs> So every time I came back to this guitar with the large sound hill, um, there was just a very slight shift in clarity over to the bass that I heard. Not that that one's bad, that one's really, really good. But I heard a little bit more openness in this guitar. And I especially heard it when I went back into um, Keep on the Sunny Side. Right there on that mid-range, uh, I just heard more separation. More separation, more clarity. And this one seemed like it blended the notes together a little bit more. Let's see. You see those notes? Kind of in a soup. Kind of in a soup. Just a little bit, you know. That's not bad. And some people like that. Some people like that. Um, I don't. I think I would, I would take this guitar, I would take the large sound hole if I was going to walk out of here because I don't think it did anything negative. There was nothing negative that I heard about this, like, oh man, you know, uh, <laughs> no, <nah>, not at all. <coughs> Sorry, dust from, um, doing all those saddles earlier. There was nothing negative about this guitar. I don't think that large sound hole did anything negative whatsoever. Unless, unless, unless you like that blossom, that blooming of the sound. I call it constipation. You could call it blooming if you want. So we're using different terms for the same thing. But on the uh, regular sound hole, when you play, especially on the low notes, there's, you can hear the notes building inside the guitar. Again, this is a small thing, but you can hear the notes kind of building up in there and echoing around, and then they come out the sound hole. And on this guitar, there's a lot less of that. They just come out the sound hole. And so you don't hear that reverb going on inside the guitar. Maybe you hear less of the wood of the guitar um, because the sound's not bouncing around in there so much. Maybe you do hear a little bit less of the wood and more of the immediate, maybe more of the top. You know, I'm just speculating here. I'm just trying to tell you what, what it almost sounds like to me, but I definitely hear a little bit of that when I'm playing it. And I don't know if it comes to the microphone because the microphone's out here, so it's just picking up the sound that's already out of the sound hole, you see. If I pick the microphone up and stick it up here in my head, uh, which I, should, I would do if I had a taller mic stand, and put that microphone up here and see if we could pick up some of that. So what I'm hearing as a player is definitely different from what that mic is picking up. Because it's only getting the sound that's already out of the hole. Whereas I'm sitting here playing the guitar and I have that motion right there. So my brain is saying, I'm expecting a note here, buddy. 
and I hear this rumble, and I feel, and I'm holding the guitar in my hand, I feel like a volcano. I'm exaggerating a little bit here, okay? Uh, it's not that dramatic of a thing, but uh, I'm trying to get it to you, because there is a very subtle thing. A lot of cars in the world here, man. They drive us up and down the road. So, anyway, I feel that rumble in the body of the guitar. Rock that truck went down the road. And then, boom, and the sound comes out of the hole. With the larger sound, there's less of that. It's more like, when it's out. The sound's out. See? The microphone's only picking that up after the sound's out of the guitar. So, I don't think... That you guys as listeners have any, you're not picking up on that. It's me as a player. Me as a player, I'm getting a more immediate feel with that large sound hole. Uh, it's a more immediate reaction. It's boom, it's like snappy, it's like whoa. It's like a, a dirt bike with a really good throttle on it versus a gritty throttle, one, or one that has a delay. You know, I'm rolling it on. Fuel injection versus carburetors. Carburetor always has a little bit of lag. You roll it on, the slide opens, the venturi and the, um, the pressure builds, and it takes a nanosecond for that fuel to go. Fuel injection on a dirt bike, you roll it, it injects, and man, it's, it is immediate. I remember the first time I rode my... Uh, first fuel injected four stroke and it was just like uh, an, an immediate thing your brain says gas your wrist turns and the bike responded whereas the carburetor is always just a slight little bit of a lag so I would say that's a good analogy this is a carbureted dirt bike the one with the regular one and with the open is a fuel injected okay so if that makes any sense use an analogy and of course the the audience would never know that. All they see is the bike accelerate. That's something that the pilot, the rider, feels. And it has nothing to do with the speed of the bike because the bike's still going the same, but there's a small reaction thing, very small reaction thing that the rider feels. And it makes him more in tune with the bike rather than anticipating that slight delay going into a corner, anticipating it. When you give it gas, it goes. Electric bikes are even more so. Uh, man, if you ever ride an electric bike, it is absolutely immediate. And you have to almost relearn, relearn how to ride because it's so immediate and so violent. So, okay, so I think that's a good analogy. This is a fuel injected that's carbureted. Nothing wrong with either one of them. You know? They both have pros and cons. But that's what I hear when I'm playing it is the more immediate sound out of the sound hole. Out on the microphone, different story. I don't know if you guys sitting out there in YouTube land um, really pick up any of that difference or not. However, guitar has got to please the guy playing it, you know? Um, I think when you get used to that reaction we ride a fuel injected dirt bike for a while, and then you go back with a carbureted bike, and that's when you really notice it. You're going into a corner, and you're kind of waiting for that last nanosecond, and you roll on that throttle, and the carbureted bike lags just that little bitty bit. And sometimes that's enough to make you stall. Sometimes that's just enough to throw you off balance, just to throw you off just a little bitty bit. Uh, then you have to relearn your systems again. So, I'm not saying, I'm just saying that once you get used, as a player, I'm used to large sound holes. All my personal guitars have large sound holes. Um, I get used to that. So when I come back to a regular, uh, I'm used to regular sound holes because all of my Martins have regular sound holes, you know, all the 70s Martins and the Authentics and things like that. Guitars that I've not, I don't really care about. Um, they're not going to be my permanent guitars. They're models and examples. So I am kind of used to that. But when I get back to the large sound, I'll be like, yeah, you know, there it is. There's that immediate response. Um, and as a player, I respond to that. So, <clears throat> this guitar, 
Would I enlarge the Santa? Yeah, I would. I'd enlarge the Santa on this. Uh, it's only four and a quarter. It goes to this ring right here. Goes to that ring. It's a small deal. I'm not cutting in a full Tony. I'm not, you know, I bet a lot of you would have trouble even noticing that. But it's there. It looks cool. <laughs> you know. There's a lot of criticism about the art sound hose. Some people are like, oh, it doesn't make any difference because Tony said so in some interview or another. Um, and yet, when you go find really early pictures of Tony when he was playing with Frank Point and Dexter, he's got a D28. It is not the authentic. It's not the, the antique. It is not the antique. It is another D28. We're not all sure what it is, but it's a D28 because you can see through here. And doesn't have a three-piece back, and it has white binding on it. So obviously, Tony put that on there, and it has a large sound hole on it. Um, it's plain as day. So even Tony did that. And if you go look on the back of the Backwaters album from Tony Rice, you can see Wyatt playing a D18 with a large sound hole. And I interviewed Wyatt about that when I was writing for Flat Pick and Guitar Magazine. It took me about three or four questions to get him to finally answer the question. And they don't want to take the responsibility of a lot of people cutting open their sound holes just to be like such and such. But the fact is, Tony did it, you know? Back when he was framed with Frank Poindexter, he had it, he 28th in a large sound hole and white binding on the fingerboard and it was not the antique because it has dots on it. Plus, and uh, he didn't have the antique then. So, even our hero. Tony does that. And some people are like, well, if uh, if that idiot wouldn't have cut open Clarence's guitar, we wouldn't even be discussing it. Yeah? Well, you know, if somebody wouldn't have left the Petri dish out and got mold all over the place, we wouldn't have discovered penicillin either, you know? Who has that? I looked that up the other day. Fielding? Who discovered penicillin? I'll give points to anybody who can tell me without looking on Wikipedia. Who discovered penicillin? Fielding. Fielding. Anyway, serendipity, you know, you discover these things. Just like the, the video I just finished here with the, uh, with the wooden saddles. Um, it was interesting, you know, I, just, I stumbled across that. All these years I've never put a wooden saddle in a guitar, and I just did it out of necessity. So, you know, there's something to large sound holes. Um, there's something to it. Uh, it's got to change the sound. If it doesn't change the sound, then, you know, what does? It, it's good. Scientifically, it changes the Hemholtz response of the guitar. So there's something. It changes the stiffness of the top because there's less wood on it, so it's stiffer right around that area. You know, scientifically, physically, physically meaning physics, there are some things that change. So... It's just whether or not you like that sound, whether you desire that sound, whether you, whether you, whether it's worth ruining the value of your guitar to get there. But look at this guitar. You know, this one's had a massively oversized bridge on it that was in the wrong place, which we have already several videos on. So the originality of this guitar is gone. It's got a different bridge plate in it now. The popsicle braces out, which all cascaded on the fact that someone put a very non-original, horrible bridge on here. I used horrible. Horrible bridge. At that point, originality is gone. It will never be restored. Never, ever, ever, ever. Ever. So, from that point on, you might as well do what you want to do with the thing. Up to your ethics and your level of whatever you have, you know. So, I replaced the bridge on there, so I replaced the bridge pad, I cleaned up that, patched that up. It's got a non-stock pickguard, which is not mine, but it's a nice pickguard. Popsicle braces out, it's a necklace set. Tuners have been changed. So many changes to this guitar. So, if the owner wants to enlarge that sound hole to a half tony, I'm all for it. I think I would do it. Um, I, I love d 35s with large sound holes because they've already got that inherent boominess, bassiness to it because they have thinner bracing 
than D8, uh, D28s. They've got um, uh, one quarter inch spacing. No, three sixteenths. I forgot the bracing. They've got they've got a smaller bracing than D28s. I'm getting all my sixteenths mixed up. They've got quarter inch. A D28 has five sixteenths. Yeah, yeah. Thinner bracing. They've got thinner bracing than D28s, so it's already a weaker top. That's how they get the base out of there. It's got basically uh, OM and triple lot bracing size. And then there's a whole history on this as to why they did this on the D35. So they've already got a weaker top in it. They give it the basiness, which can be a little bit muddy. But in this case, we've improved the muddiness by putting a bright, snappy uh, rosewood bridge on it. It's got a bright, snappy, small rosewood bridge plate. Those two are working together. Took the popsicle brace out. That gives it more treble from the open B string up scientifically. This is where the top vibrates for the open B string. Therefore, when you take this stuff out, this top is put more potentially allowed to vibrate, which it will, it will vibrate more if you will get this neck stiff and take the weight out the tuner so that all the neck vibrations transfer right here to the upper bout and vibrate the upper bout. The vibration from here probably comes from the neck and not the bridge. So you get a whole different set of vibrations coming off the neck that you can hear if you let the upper bout vibrate. If you stuff it full of wood, you're not going to hear it. Point us. All right. All that stuff makes for a bright end right here. I've documented the popsicle braids by using a frequency spectrum analyzer on an iPad. And I demonstrated that the difference between having the popsicle braids and not is more than rolling the tone knob completely on and off on a Telecaster, at least the Telecaster that I use. Okay, got that? So I took a Telecaster and I rolled the tone knob off and on the whole way and I recorded that with the frequency spectrum analyzer and then I compared that to the guitar before and after popsicle brace and it showed a higher spike after than the Telecaster did with the tone knob rolled all the way off. That's how much difference it was. All right, so I documented it as best as I could, but it's something. All right, D35. I've already done everything I can do to bring this guitar up to make it punchier and snappier, and it still has that inherent loose bracing, so it responds good, and I absolutely love modified D35s. I would enlarge a sound hole and give this guitar everything it's got. Because I didn't hear any negatives when I picked up that. All I heard was more positives, and I heard a little bit more openness, a little bit snappier tone, a little bit faster tone, and a little bit better response to my playing, which made me go, yeah. And when you as a player go, yeah, you're going to play better. I guarantee you. I absolutely guarantee you. So, we're done. I'll see what you think. What's the owner think? I mean, that's what, that's what matters. What does the owner think? Does he want to enlarge that sound hole or not? My advice? Yeah. Go for it, buddy. Great guitar. Man, it's kind of long. Um, <laughs> anyway. So, yeah.